Before I begin tonight's proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge the Garigal people of the Aora Nation, on whose ancestral land the University of Sydney stands. Good evening, and welcome you to coming to the University of Sydney for this unique Sydney Ideas Lecture. My name is Archie Johnston, and I'm the Dean of Engineering and IT at the University. We are very privileged to have with us Sir David Higgins, a renowned civil engineering alumnus of the university. David has traveled from the UK for the special occasion and is here tonight with a number of his family members, including his wife, Lady Rosalind. Welcome. Previous to David, we have been fortunate to host a number of engineering leaders as part of the Dean's International Lecture Series. These have included Sir, Gre Sir Dr. Greg Chermatov, the NASA astronaut, who is also an adjunct professor of the faculty. Australia's own astronaut, Dr. Andy Thomas. Professor George Springer, the Paul Pigott professor of engineering at Stanford University. Dr. Craig Mundy, Microsoft Chief Research and Strategy Officer. And last but not least, Dr. Abdul Kalam, the former President of India from 2002 to 2007. As Dean of Engineering and IT at the University, I am in a very fortunate position to be able to guide and develop world-class education and research programs, along with a uniquely talented group of engineering alumni, staff, and students. This has allowed me to clearly communicate to the broader community both the benefits of a strong academic engineering profession and the value to Australia of having a premium world-class engineering faculty. In the latest QS rankings released last month, our School of Civil Engineering was ranked number one in Australia and number 16 in the world. We have a number of alumni from industry working with us, supporting and guiding the development of engineering leaders for tomorrow. So, David needs little introduction to most of you here this evening, but I'll give you a very brief overview of his key achievements in his distinguished career. After graduation, he worked in the UK and Africa before returning to Australia to join the international property and construction company, Lend Lease in 1985. Ten years later, he was appointed Managing Director and Chief Executive when a key project included the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney. In March 2000, David became Chief Executive of English Partnerships, a UK government na national regeneration agency. He was then appointed Chief Executive of the Olympic Development Authority in March 2006. He was then at the helm of one of the biggest construction projects in Europe, the 2012 Olympic Park development in London. In June 2011, he was received a, knighthood, a knighthood for his contribution to this transformational East London project. The London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games were credited as the Regeneration Games, delivering transformational change and leaving a long legacy of sports venues, new homes, importantly new transport links, new energy networks and a new urban park for a previously ignored area of London. If you think that was a challenging role, David has now taken on an even bigger challenge as Chief Executive of Network Rail, one of the UK's largest engineering companies, which is responsible for running, maintaining and developing the country's entire rail infrastructure. As mentioned, David has travelled to Australia to deliver this lecture this evening. 
He also received this evening his 2011 Faculty of Engineering and Information Technologies Alumnus of the Year, which was given to him earlier tonight. David brings a unique perspective of his work on significant infrastructure projects throughout the world. And I'm delighted to welcome him to give us his talk on innovation as a catalyst for growth. Thank you. Welcome, David. Thank you, Archie, and I'm really privileged to be here today, and I've had a fantastic day at the university, and uh, I hope uh, after I speak briefly enough, we can get into some interesting questions about it. I wanted to focus tonight's talk about innovation and, catal and the, as a catalyst for growth, but I particularly wanted to focus about infrastructure, how it's delivered as a catalyst for growth and how it works with society. It happens to be very appropriate here in New South Wales in Australia, but it's also appropriate around the world. As the world looks for methods of recovery and, and jobs and growth, infrastructure is seen as a great catalyst for that. And I don't have to, you don't have to take my word for it because I quickly checked on the web and I looked at some eminent people, so that's our Prime Minister, David Cameron, quotes it as the invisible thread that ties our society and our prosperity together. And President Obama again, uh, in focusing on the huge investment that the current administration has made into infrastructure and repairing and replacing infrastructure in America, uh, need to outbuild, out innovate, out educate every other country on earth. Well, that's very American, but it's certainly... <laughs> But it's certainly a good ambition. And then closer to home, oh, no, that's not right. Sorry, closer to home, um, the um, Australian Prime Minister, of course, recently quoted the importance of infrastructure and also the uh, role of uh, investment, the investment deficit. It's called the infrastructure deficit in Australia. So it's a hugely important investment in the country. Now, infrastructure, really, really great infrastructure stands the test of time. It not only delivers a physical infrastructure, it brings social good. It brings social cohesion, wealth, and greater employment opportunities to communities. And that's a real test to be able to tell whether infrastructure works. And so what I, I talk today is about four infrastructure projects around the world, primarily in Europe, and how they were developed, and what I see in them, and why I see them as being great infrastructure projects. Infrastructure can be quite boring as a topic, and so I thought I'd try to keep you interested. I, I better move first to Scandinavia. And Scandinavia is far more famous nowadays for coming out with thrillers, um, ghastly thrillers. And if you've followed from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo to Wallander and more recently The Killing, and I noticed when I, um, I was checking the TV Times here uh, yesterday that you've got the bridge here also, which has started on SBS on Wednesday night, 8.30 tomorrow, in case you're interested. <laughs> but, um, but the bridge is a great story, and of course the great hero of the entire 10-part crime thriller is the actual bridge itself. That's why I particularly liked it as a thriller. Um, but, it, but it opens with this gruesome scene of the victim being found on the bridge on this painted line, which is the, the gap exactly between um, southern Sweden, Malmo, uh, and, of course, Ka Copenhagen, which is the capital of Denmark. And the victim is there, lying there. And, of course, because the victim is on halfway between the two countries, the whole crime series, 10-pack series, has to start with the two different police forces working together. So it's an interesting co-production. It's bilingual, and it's produced by the broadcasting corporations of both different countries. So it's not only a bridge that connects them, the two broadcasting companies have had to work together. And the really interesting part, why the series became such a cult series in Scandinavia, is that the two heroes of the show, besides the bridge, of course, was the, the lead role from the, Scandinavia, from the Swedish side is a very tall, attractive, blonde woman who's the chief detective, uh, and she's um, very clinical. She sees relationships and sex as just a transaction, something that can be taken and left behind. And on the other side, of course, is her Dan Danish counterpart, and he's... Um, a bumbling middle-aged um, detective who's left behind him a debris of social relationships, which the Swedish counterpart finds perplexing, confusing, and really very, very bewildering. Whereas the Danish head of a detective finds the Swedish woman a robot, 
And as they initially have to work together and are forced to work together, they find this cultural difference um, shocking. But by the end of the 10 part series, they learn to trust each other and rely on each other. I won't give away the ending. But they learn to rely on each other and depend on each other. And the great thing, why it became so important, is that for the Swedish people, that's exactly how they see everyone in Denmark. The way the character played it, and ditto for the Danish, they've always seen Swedish as cold and clinical and, and slightly difficult to deal with. And, and so it's been a, a program that's struck an accord with both, with both nations. As for the bridge, well, there it is. It's a fabulous bridge. It's a fabulous bit of engineering. Um, it's both a bridge and a tunnel. Um, and it started in initially right back in the 1930s, finally finished in 2000. A huge project. But what it did, it's transformed that bottom end of Scandinavia because Malmo, which was a crime-ridden, naturally, uh, part of, part of um, Sweden, but isolated, quite isolated from Stockholm, um, had no access to any major airport. That suddenly was commuter distance, because the bridge, of course, has both train and, and road. It's a commuter suburb now of Copenhagen. So wealth has, has come to this part of, of Sweden. It's got an international airport on its doorstep. And for, Den and for Denmark and Copenhagen, a city which was getting into low growth because it was stifled, it had no chance to expand, now it's suddenly annexed part of Sweden. And so it's, it's got low-cost housing, it's got a huge chance to grow in its population. The bridge itself um, has been successful. You can see, you could say, if you looked at a straight cash flow benefit, it probably in the short term hasn't covered its cash flow. Has it been successful in transforming that part of Scandinavia? Eminently so. It's brought the two countries together, it's given them a greater understanding of each other. Economically, it's been a huge boost. So much so that Denmark now plans the next major bridge tunnel, which will link northern Germany and Hamburg across, across to um, uh, Denmark, because they see the huge advantage. And who's going to pay for it? Fundamentally, Denmark will pay for it. The Germans say, I don't see what it does for us. But the, the Denmark, they, they see a huge benefit to Copenhagen, and now this, this infrastructure ribbon that ties together what were really disparate islands. So successful, socially, long-term, changing societies, bringing them closer together. Next one um, is Rotterdam. So Holland's an interesting country. I sat on a, a treasury committee for two years in Holland advising the Dutch government on PFIs and how they should plan their infrastructure in 2000 to 2002. If you go back in history and, and look at Holland, uh, in the 1950s, Holland was, um, had a great uh, windfall. It discovered huge reserves of gas off the coast of, of Holland. And this gas brought um, huge wealth to the country. It made not only the country independent from energy point of view, it meant that Holland became one of the major gas exporters to the rest of Europe. It brought an enormous number of jobs because there was a huge amount of jobs in building all the terminals um, on land and the offshore facilities as well. So the boom. It, it triggered what's become known now as the Dutch disease. Um, the Gilda rose enormously. Wage and labour costs went up considerably in the country. And at the end, when all the construction was finished to build the gas terminals and the gas offshore, um, there were very few jobs based around gas anymore. So you had a rich country with a rich Gilda, but very few jobs, because in the meantime, this high cost and currency had destroyed manufacturing in the country and made tourism uncompetitive. And so Holland faced a real challenge. And so as a country, they looked at their overall planning um, and they, I went back there in 2004 with the UK government to look at how they did their planning for this, for this landlocked country. And you looked at what they did. They made some critical decisions. I always say to the British, um, how big do you think Skipal Airport is? Because they're always terrified. And I say, well, it's four times the size of Heathrow. And they put aside the land in such a landlocked country to plan for the future growth of Skipole when we couldn't do it in Britain. And so Rotterdam is a great port. It's owned by the city of Rotterdam and by the country, uh, by Holland, equally. And how they make money from it is they lease out space on the port. And so that brings an enormous amount of revenue uh, into the port, but also brings 88,000 direct jobs and numerous indirect jobs. So it's, it's a very valuable asset to the port. But the way they deal with it, they always invest in advance of need. And so, um, and as a port, it's not really a Dutch port because it's got a great advantage. It sits on two rivers converged to form the port of Rotterdam. And so 50% of all goods that are unloaded in Rotterdam are sent by barge to the heart of, heart of Europe and, and to Germany. 
80% of all the produce that lands at Rotterdam doesn't go to Holland. The vast majority of it goes to Germany. It's Germany's deep water port in Holland. It's a little piece of Germany that happens to be in Holland, and Holland sees it as such. Germany relies on it, and so Holland, in advance of need, um, have built a high-speed freight network through Holland going only to Germany. No benefit to Holland whatsoever. Highly controversial, but the politicians planned and said, we have to do everything possible to ensure Rotterdam remains Germany's major port, and they need to be totally dependent on us, and we shouldn't do anything to encourage them to expand Hamburg or anywhere else, because we're Germany's key port. And, and the wealth that's flowed and the many jobs that have turned around Holland and made employment and wealth back into that country has been a fascinating example in long-term infrastructure planning. Well supported and respected, and the Dutch now understand the important role that Rotterdam plays in, in that society. And so to High Speed One. So High Speed One was a, a rail link using the Channel Tunnel. Talked about first um, the Channel Tunnel over 100 years ago. Of course, the, the British terrified that the teeming masses of Europe would uh, invade um, England with their good food and coffee, but that never happened. And finally, it required Francois Mitterrand and Margaret Thatcher in, in 1986 to shake hands on a deal, and the tunnel went ahead. Um, but of course, the, the English didn't build the fast train on the other side. So for 20 years, we laboured through the country fields of Kent to get into, into Waterloo. But finally, High Speed One has been built, and so it's now two hours door to door uh, between the two cities. Um, at a cost that's not going to be recovered in the short term, not even in the next 30 to 40 years, where you go anywhere near recovering the cost that took to not only build um, High Speed One, which goes from St Pancras, St Pancras in the centre of London to Dover, but also refurbishing this wonderful bit of engineering at the station there, which is a wonderful gateway way to London. But it's changed the way that London and Paris see each other. So families nowadays in, in central London get on a train with their families, go to sleep after dinner, having had dinner in the station here, and wake up in the ski fields of Europe. That's the way you do it. French, French doctors work on the French health system, which doesn't pay a lot of money, three days a week, and then move on the Channel Tunnel and on High Speed One to Harley Street and spend three days working in London and make a lot of money. That's how they operate, because they're so used to being able to move across the channel efficiently. 80% of all movements, passenger movements, between London and Paris now go by train. 15 million people a year use that service. It's nothing for me um, uh, and my wife, if we want to visit Paris, to get on the train after work on a Friday night, have dinner in Paris, have breakfast on Monday morning, early breakfast, mind you, uh, in Paris, and be back in the office in time Monday morning for work and spend three nights in Paris. It's changed the way these two countries relate to each other. It's brought economic wealth um, to the City of London because it's meant the investment bankers can move very rapidly between, between these two cities. It's transformed the way we operate. And of course, anyone privileged enough to experience Olympics started in central London and six minutes later you're in the middle of the Olympic site through the line that was high speed one during the Olympic Games. It transformed the way people saw East London. And so finally to the fourth example, which was, um, which was a transformation of East London. So East London is an interesting area. I must admit, when I was first asked to go to Stratford to look at this site, I thought it was where Shakespeare was played up in the Cotswolds. I hadn't realised there's also another Stratford, um, but it was in East London. And most people in West London never had either, because no one would ever go to East London, or East, East Birmingham, or East Manchester, because with the prevailing winds, the industrial base of all the major cities in the UK were based on the east side of the cities. So the cement works, the power stations, the gas works are always based. So the winds blew the soot and rubbish across to France, um, but, but away from the wealthy areas of the city. So the wealthy people lived on the west side of, of London. On the east side, there was no infrastructure because poor people lived there and you didn't have to have infrastructure. So that was what happened there. And what's more, if you had any rubbish, you dumped it in East London. So, so London dumped its sewerage, raw sewerage, uh, in the middle of the Olympic site. Um, so 50 times a year, half a million cubic metres of raw sewerage would dump into the middle of the Olympic site, even up until very, very recently. Um, toxic waste, um, when the Blitz happened in, in the city of London, all the rubble from the Blitz was taken and dumped on what was a, a beautiful green valley uh, fed by the Lee River. Marshlands, irises, beautiful uh, wetlands, and market gardens. 
but raised seven metres with toxic rubbish and, and dump. And not only a physical, physical wasteland, a human wasteland. Because as you came to, to England, the first place in the docks where poor people came to was Rees London. Incredibly diverse, you know, uh, 50 major languages in Newham in terms of the schools that have to teach. Incredibly diverse uh, place. But once you have any level of education or skills or any money, the first thing you did was get the hell out of East London and try and aspire to get to West London. And so as we started the Olympic project, I spent a lot of time, um, as I was doing my early research, just walking around East London and listening to communities and going to pubs and looking at, at talking to schools, going to the health department uh, and looking at the, the statistics. And then I was given a chance to meet um, with Sebco. We were invited to see Tony Blair to make our pitch as to why we should get the budget that was necessary for the Games. Um, and I said to him, um, East London and the four boroughs that make up and join and form the Olympic site are four of the ten most deprived boroughs or suburbs in the whole of the UK. And we measure it by any measure you like, but whether it be employment skills, health, wealth, um, violence, um, security, and the cost of the country is massive, but these are highly deprived, high, highly deprived um, areas of London. They happen to be your most loyal electorates who always vote Labour, so you should, should uh, recognise that. But if I dial back 100 years, we did check it, said 100 years ago they were still in the 10 worst, so nothing's changed. 100 years of politics and everything you've done, all the policies to turn around, deprivation have had no influence whatsoever on this area of London because the physical infrastructure is a dumping ground. It's a disgrace, it's been a tip, it's full of old power lines and wrecking yards and, and piles of old fridges and it's a disgrace. Three million people live in East London and there is no city. There's no place to shop. You have to go to Oxford Street or you have to go to Blue Water to shop. There's no office buildings so there's no jobs. There's no white collar jobs in the whole of East London and it was hard to believe when I first started um, talking to the Westfield group, I remember speaking to um, Frank and Stephen Lowy and I said, imagine Sydney without Parramatta, with no city, no place where you can shop, no community, no park, uh, no place where people would naturally concentrate on, and, and that was East London. And so we made the, made the case and eventually we got sufficient money and we put a huge amount of time as we started to develop East London to make sure the community owned the solution. It was no, no good imposing a solution on East London. And we got that message loud and clear um, from the residents of East London. We don't want you crowd from West London arriving and gentrifying this place and changing it. There's many things about East London which we hold value and we want ownership of this place and we want to be engaged and properly consulted and have a say in how this place is going to be redeveloped. It became central to the whole way we developed the site. Even as much as leaving the central corridors through the middle of the site much to the concern of the security services, open and accessible to the community at any time of the day so they could walk into their project and their site at their whim with their school kids and everything else and see exactly what was going on. And so the area is transformed and what was so amazing is uh, the great concern in transport of getting people to East London is that most of the people in West London had never been there and so how they would find this place was a concern. But with nine railway lines, the people of West London came along and said, wow, this is different. I thought this place was a dump. And they came there and saw a fabulous brand new shopping centre and a huge new village and gardens and parklands, which we purposely designed to show that this was the most beautiful part of, of London in terms of its irises and its wetlands and its, and its greens. And people came away from that, from the grounds, and you can see here some of the wildflowers. All the whole park was just a mass of wildflowers everywhere and, and millions of irises are all locally grown that transformed a heavily contaminated wasteland into something that was very special. So, four projects that firstly will stand the test of time, bring social wealth, really are important, bring and, and challenge the issue of inclusion and, and do that and have a social side as well as being commercially, long-term commercially successful. Crucial in terms of infrastructure. Nowadays, infrastructure is no good having a good plan to build it and great engineers and programming expertise if you can't bring the local community and politicians will never go against local communities. So you have to be able to convince the local communities whether it be on a bridge in Denmark um, or Rotterdam with a high speed service there uh, or, or Kent or East London that there really is a value which the local community get out of the development of infrastructure. That one there, there we are. So 
the lessons learned, it's a strategic asset, it's a catalyst of growth. And so in closing, um, I'd just like to leave you with one thought. Think about Sydney, and think about the great bits of infrastructure that have been put in this city. Uh, and I named three. I'd say it's the Harbour Bridge, the Opera House, and the Botanic Gardens. I mean, I'm sure there's many others, but I just choose those three. And the three define Sydney. They define what international visitors think about Sydney, and they are, they are something that Sydney siders identify with. They, they champion them, and they're something that they really recognise the value. And the challenge we have is, in 50 years' time, what will Sydney siders and people in New South Wales and, that, for that matter, Australia say, this is the infrastructure which we own, it's ours, we champion it, and it's helped define our society because it's brought greater inclusion and greater social cohesion to our society. That's our challenge going forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. He's um, indicated he's quite happy to take uh, questions. And uh, we've got two microphones, I think, either side, uh, up at the front. So if people would like to make their way towards uh, the microphones, then we'll probably take one from each side. And uh, we'll proceed on like that, if it's uh, possible. So, just before the queues build up, maybe... Oh, no? I'm oh, sorry. If you can announce your name and your organisation, that would be great. Hey, yes, my name's Ashley Douglas. I'm from John Holland Construction in Sydney. Um, so, David, I'm interested in your views. Um, this might sound like a loaded question because you're only recently back in the country, but our Premier here has just announced a pretty wide-ranging scheme to develop infrastructure, particularly in Sydney and particularly some of the more challenging parts of Sydney, uh, the western part and Parramatta Road and such. There's been a number of negative comments in the media about the fact that you build large bits of road infrastructure and invariably find those uh, conduits being filled in a few years' time and people with nowhere to park and nowhere to go. And the general argument, I suppose, if I can refer to the Sydney Morning Herald's view on life and others, is that uh, much better to take the harder decision, which is to build heavy rail infrastructure and provide for future generations rather than, I suppose, what could be termed a short-term fix. I'm paraphrasing a little. Um, I've just left from a, a holiday in Johannesburg and Johannesburg seems to me to be a, an area that is, uh, has a huge um, supply of multi-lane uh, carriageways all around the place with uh, circular freeways all over the shop and the traffic is appalling and they've got a very low level of public transport. I just wondered if you had a view on, on that and whether you think the direction the current government is leading is, is the correct one. Uh, well, I had lunch with... Um, I was privileged to sit next to Nick today, so I have to be careful what I say. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah. If, I'm sure there are missing links, and so I'm not going to say that the plan isn't very well thought through, and listen, there's not limitless pools of money so I'm not saying the plan isn't a very, very good plan because we all know what the missing links in the road infrastructure uh, in Sydney are. But all I would say, if you, if you look long term, they're talking about a million extra people uh, being in Sydney in the next 20 years. And the vast majority of all those jobs being in the city, in the CBD, in the services area. So whether it be here and the redevelopment of the brewery site going through, through to Bangaroo or the redevelopment of, of the convention centre, most of the jobs and the services jobs will come in the city. So my question is, where do the million people live and how do you get them into the city? Now, all the great international cities that ultimately work over the long term have fantastic public transport. Now, whether it's be Hong Kong or what they've done in the last 20 years, or whether it be London living on its legacy, the Victorians of 100 years ago, or Paris the same way, or, or Tokyo, or, um, or um, New York. They've all worked that way. And so with, with the movement to tertiary services, why shouldn't people from Wollongong to Gosford, from Campbelltown to Richmond to Penrith, have the right to travel into the service jobs in the city and get that wealth? Uh, ultimately, the only way to do that is, is with mass transit, because eventually cars strangle the city, and eventually they strangle the quality of life. So I'm not, um, and, but there's no doubt you can get more out of existing rail networks. I mean, we, we realise that in the UK, but there are obvious missing links. There are obvious missing links where you've got a two-track railway line which is multi-mixed mode from freight to, 
to commute it a long distance. That doesn't make sense. So it's, it's difficult, but I think if you try justifying it just on one thing, it'll be very, very difficult to do. Just the same, if you try justifying Badgerys Creek and I just need to build an airport, then you'll never get the support of the public and therefore the politicians will never support it. It has to be a much bigger story if you're going to win an argument like a second airport or why you're doing heavy rail. You have to, you look at High Speed One, I mean, what it's done, it's opened up that whole area of Kent outside now, Ashford. Um, Ashford is half an hour to London nowadays. Ebbsfleet's 15 minutes. Um, if if um, Campbelltown was 15 minutes to central Sydney, which it should be with high-speed rail, uh, as part of eventually a long-term network down to Melbourne or whatever, you might start to sell it to people there, why this is a long-term investment, what it does for rateable value for property or jobs or everything else. So have I answered your question? Yes. High-speed ra high, heavy rail is ultimately the only way to move large numbers of people into a, into a developed world city. And eventually, they get strangled if you don't do that. It doesn't work in the other way. But they're very expensive. But you've got to make it worth something else. So Crossrail, I mean, London hasn't done a damn thing for 100 years. So finally, after that, they're putting heavy rail in. So, but Crossrail works on the added rateable value that happens on all the buildings within a, a cooey of every major railway station, because they'll all benefit. Um, hi, my name's Scott McGill. Um, I'm from the city of Sydney, but I'm here just in a private capacity. Um, so, David, I'm just interested in your thoughts, um, the role, potential role of public-private partnerships in delivering some of these significant infrastructure projects, and particularly uh, probably some of the pitfalls that can sort of be inherent in that relationship in terms of delivering a successful public outcome and how they might be addressed. Well, I mean, public-private is, is absolutely essential. I think the first thing I'd say is um, ultimately you can't fight transparency. And this is, a, this is a big debate to have in any, any government or even private companies. But um, I remember really, really early on, on the Olympics, on the project there, we're getting all these leaks in the newspapers, and they're incredibly accurate. And so the people in dark sunglasses who were embedded in our organisation came to me and said, we can find out exactly who's leaking all these stories for you. you know, we have ways of finding out. <laughs> Tapping everyone's emails, phones, I said, listen, you know, go away. Uh, you're going to become the story. Uh, I said, frankly, um, if what I'm reading in the newspaper is correct, I really want to know about it, and I prefer to read it in the newspaper now rather than find it coming to be a major problem in five years' time because we haven't been open enough to consider it. So the first thing about public-private is it must be transparent. It must be contestable by the public. If you can't explain it to the public because of confidentiality clauses or whatever, there's something wrong, wrong with that level of... Now, the other thing we've all learned is that the best people to borrow money long term have a government guarantee wrapped around them. It's taken us a long time to work that out, PFIs and everything else, but I mean, the government in the UK can now borrow 20 year money at 3% nominal. As I've said to them, is go for it. You know, this doesn't last for very long, but I mean, so you, we have, uh, in the case of Network Rally, what's called a regulated asset base. We have an implicit government guarantee, but we're an independent private company, not controlled by the government. So we get the benefit of a very, very low cost of capital but you then want to be able to engage with the private sector. The biggest thing on, on any public-private financing is long-term capital certainty. So if you look at the Highways Agency in the UK, for instance, it depends every year on a budget settlement. When you're planning for long-term maintenance of motorways, that's a very difficult environment to be in. But if you're planning for something like railways, we have a five-year settlement that we negotiate two years out. So we know... Um, this year or we'll know for the next seven years what money we have to invest long term in the railways. It, it gives certainty of, of not only for the organisation but to supply chain because the supply chain can't invest in their systems and technology and skills if it's too short term. Yep, right. Sorry. Yeah. My name is Joseph Davis. I'm from the Faculty of Engineering and IT in this university. Uh, so, David, you mentioned the importance of buy-in from the community and participation involvement of the communities where the infrastructure projects are being planned and executed. Now, you'll agree that this is not the easy thing to do, given the kinds of political issues that you have to deal with. I was just wondering if you could talk us through some of the kind of methods you will employ in order to achieve this, and also if you could comment on possibly the role of social media in achieving these kinds of goals. Yeah, well, I mean, you're right. Social media is absolutely immediate, and you can't fight it. Um, all I would say is you can't expect a politician nowadays to come out against a well-organized local interest group and stand against it. It's incredibly difficult. 
So the only way to deal with this is to get, gather local grassroots support and to have well-informed, well-briefed um, media, regional media, much more powerful than anyone ever thought, uh, trade media, really important, because the big media brands, the big newspapers, they often don't take the detailed work themselves. They'll read the trade medias that do a, a lot of in-depth report. And it's, it's important nowadays to find out which journalists and which researchers the industry respects, and they take their knowledge. I, I now, for my sins, know who's the most influential rail journalist in the UK. It sounds bizarre, but it's important to know them, because when they ask you a question, you find they're much more informed about rail than I am. But what they write, in the end, the, our employees, um, the public, the ministers, know more about, believe it more than I did. I mean, it was funny. I, I deal a lot with, with one particular rail magazine in the UK, and a lot of our our in-house people said, you, you take such a, a ridiculous approach to this individual. Why? You treat him like royalty. I said, well, when the cabinet was going up to Manchester to announce the latest budget announcement, I said, I wasn't invited. But he sat opposite the Secretary of State the whole way up to brief the Secretary of State and the whole way back with the Treasurer. So why, why aren't I recognising it? He's a key person that influences the politicians and, as you know, with the various bloggers, influence the public. So you have to... You have to the job of translating what you're doing into something um, uh, that's clear to the public is a real challenge. Simplifying things down is incredibly difficult, but once you've got it, important message to get right. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Chris, you know, not of any particular organisation, although I uh, do work with the Warren Centre. Um, very appropriate that the uh, faculty here is both information technology and engineering, and my question uh, relates to that. Since you were first appointed to the uh, London Olympics uh, Delivery Authority, smartphones were invented and introduced. The iPad has only been around for 27 months. And quite apart from the social media that uh, our colleague mentioned, it's the whole uh, impact of those technologies. Why are we still thinking in terms of people coming to the CBD to work when at the same time we're talking about bring your own device working from home, uh, working anywhere, supply chains that are not chains anymore but actually networks and so on. My question then in essence is, are we really looking forward for uh, infrastructure development in the light of these emerging technologies or are we just really projecting from what we've seen in the past? Uh, it's a good point. We've just opened a new head office um, for our organisation in Milton Keynes, which is out of the centre of the, of the city. We moved everyone from in our city location to this place. It's entirely open plan, hot desk, no fixed um, PCs anywhere. Everyone's just working on iPads or, or laptops in the entire place there. It's got about a 70% about a, a capacity for the 3,500 people that work out of this place. So the other 30% are on the network somewhere and the, the hot desk in, the, in this environment there. Um, do you have to have uh, city centre operations? It'll change, but all I would say is um, Bloomberg at the moment um, are building a building of a um, million square feet, so it's 100,000 square metres opposite St Paul's in the middle of London because it must be one of the most connected organisations in the world, but they need a core base to, to relate to Europe and they're building this massive um, building there because they think they need to have some at least home base to, for them to come back to. Google's doing the same. And, and King's Cross Belt. They're building a whole new headquarters there for all of Europe based out of there. They've chosen incredibly connected sites so they can get to places, that particularly um, public transport uh, around there. But I think you're still going to have the need for people to cluster together, cluster together um, albeit a lot of our people now um, with, uh, with iPads, I mean, we issue our track workers with, with iPhones. And so when they have a problem, they photograph the difficult points or whatever, um, send it back to our engineers that sit in Glasgow, they um, make a decision on it, then approve it over the iPhone, and the record that they took is then put into our database to help our asset management base. So yeah, it, apps, uh, the way passenger information, ticketing, and, and pri ticket pricing is going to revolutionise in the next, uh, next 10 years. <coughs> Thanks, David, uh, for a very interesting talk. Uh, my name's Robert Small. I work for Oricon Engineers Consultants. But I've got an interest in bicycle transport. Um, the corporate's um, very interested in bike riding to work and cycle challenges and provide beautiful infrastructure for us cyclists. 
but um, there's sort of reluctance to provide infrastructure by governments and councils and a bit of public opposition. And so I was wondering if you could talk about your experience with bicycle transport in Europe and London and places like Copenhagen. Well, I mean, the, the fabulous cities of Europe, I mean, Amsterdam is amazing. So 70% of people that live in Amsterdam regularly ride a bike in the city, 70%. And you see, you see um, parents going out with little kids, you see people going out to dinner with parties riding in the wintertime. Uh, they don't just do it when it's easy. But the whole city is integrated. So you get off at Schiphol Airport, you get in heavy rail, you come into the main Amsterdam station, you've got tram and light rail, you've got a, a bicycle station for 10,000 bikes there. Um, and, then, and then Utrecht has the same. Uh, and so the whole place is fully integrated for cycles from scratch. And London is, is refitting London now for bikes. The Boris bikes have been incredibly successful. And we're putting bike stations at all of our, our new stations around London. And I mean, it's still for mavericks that ride bikes in many ways, but there's been a, a groundswell of shift of, of people riding cycles in central London to get to work, and it's, it's only going to increase, only going to go one way. I mean, my chairman, 65-year-old ex-2IC um, of Ford Motor Company, cycles everywhere on his bikes. I'm terrified every time he leaves the office, <laughs> as does Boris. So you know, it's, 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 it's changing. It's still dangerous because in Amsterdam, if you have an accident with a cyclist, the car owner is in the wrong. It doesn't matter what the cyclist did. It's just a rule. In, in London, um, car drivers are still aggressive to cyclists, and they stu there's still this hostility, and frankly, some of the cyclists um, uh, are pretty uh, difficult too. Mm. Okay. Very interesting, thanks. <laughs> Good evening. <coughs> Good evening, Sir David. Um, my name is Tor Slater, I'm from the University of Sydney, I work in the Technology Transfer Office. Um, I'm a native of East London, um, I grew up in Stratford, it was great to hear your talk. Um, about the work there and, and with the stakeholders and, and leaving a legacy. Um, uh, I have two questions um, together. Uh, the first part is, is with my old East Londoner hat on um, to ask about the insights in how well the legacy is going to work. I mean, it's very early days, but, but, but what you've seen post the games. Um, and the second part is, is um, lessons you learnt um, specifically there, um, particularly in the breadth of, of stakeholders that you spoke to. Um, and informing the, the new conversations that you're having um, through Network Rail that you didn't think you were going to have uh, before you started there. Yeah, um, so yeah, will Legacy work in, in um, East London? And my answer is absolutely yes. Uh, with nine railway lines, jobs will come. Not only will people be able to get there and therefore employers will want to be based here um, and the cost structure with all the infrastructure in place is such that, that, that it will work. So long, long term, this, this area, it's the second most connected site in London after King's Cross. And King's Cross, after so many years of false starts, is now booming. And it's fantastic to see that, that, that whole uh, area take off. So, no, I'm, I'm, you've got a, a billion and a half pound investment by a private company in the biggest shopping centre in Europe. Two big hotels already open and running. An office building, these are all open before the games. Uh, a village that's got 3,000 homes and already uh, finished and, and just going into been refitted now after the game. So that's the first thing, six international um, sporting centres there and a fabulous park. So yeah, it, it, will, it will change. You know, should West Ham take over the stadium? Well, I've never been a great fan of West Ham, I have to be honest. So I'm not really worried about which football club takes over the stadium. Sports, the legacy, and the public facilities there will make it um, a very success. So I remember about three or four years ago taking one of the big Qatari investment funds to an apartment project overlooking the whole Olympic site. And they said, how many acres here? I said, um, 500 acres. They said, how many railway lines again? I said, nine. They said, how much money is going in to clean up the site and put all the long-term infrastructure? I said, nine billion pounds. They said, is there any debt attached there? I said, none at all. I said, can we buy it? I said, <laughs> <laughs> they eventually bought the village and tried to buy the rest of the whole site. They said, well, this is an obvious no-brainer. We'll, we'll buy the entire estate. So it's not for sale. So I, yeah, I think it will, it will succeed. For the rest of, the, rest of my other experiences, um, yeah, well, uh, the problem with um, dealing with a state monopoly that's, that has a very unclear governance structure, which is what, what Network Rail is, we're not really accountable to anyone, which angers politicians. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. We're accountable to a certain unusual structure, but we're not accountable to traditional shareholders or to ministers, and so that's a benefit sometimes. Um, but, but the key thing there in an organisation is not to be defensive and to be open to new ideas and to say to our organisation... Um, we can all make mistakes, 
and we can take risk. In fact, I encourage you to take risk. And when you, when you take risks and we make mistakes, we need to talk about it. Because if we don't, it's really scary. And therefore, we have to have a culture and an organisation where you're prepared to talk about mistakes and learn from it. Now, if you keep making mistakes all the time, you're not going to hang around, of course. But you have to try and change that culture to one where people feel they can talk about their honest mistakes uh, and then learn from them and become a smarter organisation and have less defensive um, behaviours to all of the partners and government. And that's the challenge we're going through right now. You tell me when you're bored yeah. and you want to go off and get some uh, booze, just tell me to stop. <coughs> I'm happy to do it. Art shows all to stop me anyway. Uh, Sir David, Sorry. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, most interesting. My name is Norbert Kelvin, um, solicitor with Hancock Solicitors. I was an engineer, or still am an engineer. Um, I was intrigued at two, I'm intrigued at two problems. One is that Everybody that wants to invest in infrastructure is rushing to be second because the people who actually build the infrastructure generally find that they're in trouble and they then have to on-sell uh, to try and recover something to a second investor who then probably makes a better return because they've obviously paid less for the investment. The second one uh, question is that in the light of the huge cost of infrastructure and probably huge per uh, capita, uh, in Australia uh, we have, what, 25 million people? And if we wanted to join our major centres like Darwin, Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Cairns, uh, with high-speed rail, how would we ever pay for it yeah, um, no, you're absolutely right. Um, first, I think the, the answer to the first question is uh, government probably in many roles has to take the first risk. So if you look at the Channel Tunnel, it's, it's a central bit of infrastructure for England, isn't it? It wrote off 5 billion euro in debt. And now it's in a company which is a publicly listed company, Eurotunnel. It's very successful. It has freight and, and passenger. It, um, <clears throat> it also runs ferries as well. It's a very viable company. It needed to write off five billion debt, or the two governments that underwrote the Channel Tunnel, French and British government, needed to write off that debt. Because the tolls you got for the trains couldn't possibly ever recover that debt. High Speed One, it's been sold for the next 30 years to a consortium of pension funds who are going to own it and manage it for the next 30 years. You get back half of what it cost. You can't expect the private sector to pay that first development cost and take the extreme risk of developing it. It's very logical for the private sector to now own the Channel Tunnel or own High Speed One or own the concession for Crossrail after the government's put their share in and taken the force majeure risk on the development. <clears throat> because for the private sector to take that unlimited risk on, for instance, Crossrail in London, which could bring down the tube system when it's, when it's been installed with a signalling system, no insurance company is going to back any contractor to do that. But So what I'm saying is I think there's a... a, a a mature sharing of risk between the public and private sector. And the public sector has to understand, in many cases, they are the best organisation to take the sovereign risk. It doesn't mean that in doing that, they have to then have an open checkbook and deliver that. How should you deliver infrastructure in Australia challenge the entire way of delivering it? Uh, and I look at high speed too, and it'll be 2035 before we get the railway to Manchester and Leeds, which is where all the money is and it'll be 35 billion pounds in today's pounds, which means in, when it's finished, it'll be who knows how many billions of pounds. I say, uh, give me it in 10 years. Well, I should take 25 years to build a railway line. In China, they'd build it in two and a half. So what the hell's going on here? Um, so I, I think you need to challenge the paradigms. I mean, you know, I mean let's face it, developing a high-speed service between here and Melbourne, it's not very difficult to go over those plains of... Uh, of Western New South Wales. I know it's very complicated coming into Melbourne and it'll be complicated coming into Sydney. That's where the money is, but um, a lot of it, once you've done the Act of Parliament and got planning through, which if you, if you come through with a proper bill, um, should, should make it easy. So uh, you have to really, really challenge the cost. I mean, I hear some of these numbers bandied around, they're mad. They really are crazy amounts of money. They should be challenging it. <clears throat> David, my name is Michael Visante and I'm the editor of the Sydney Uni Alumni Magazine. And I have a very simple question for you. Um, can you tell us uh, what mistakes you've made? Um, 
how you rectified them and what you've learned from them. Um, always my biggest mistakes are with people. And it's always the best challenge you have. And um, after a while, you realise you're not a very good engineer anyway. I mean, it's self-indulgent for me to act as an engineer, I have to be honest. I, I did do it a bit on the Olympics every Friday afternoon because it was fun um, to go through all the drawings. But you know, I thought I could add some value. But in the end, the most important role I do is to get the best out of people. It's all about getting the best performance, find out where they can work better, where I can work better with them, uh, and having that honest issue of performance management. That's my job. I've got, you know, got 35,000 people that currently work in the organisation with another 80,000 indirectly, and the, te the top 10 directors I work with, my job is to get them to perform best. I can't do the job for them. And the biggest mistakes I've ever made is I've compromised on people. I've either not supported them, I've hung around with them too long, I've chosen the wrong person. And that's always, you know, when you look in roles where leadership's required and, and expertise, uh, you know, ask yourself, I, I've done so many interviews with people, and uh, I say, you know, it's, it's 20 seconds before you made up their mind. It's not really, it's 10 seconds. The minute they've walked in the door, you've said, I don't like that person. And it's incredibly difficult to get that mindset, which is absolutely wrong, out of your head, uh, and trying to choose people that are different from yourself, have a different perspective, and bring some level of diversity or different thinking or skill base that you don't have. So, so the issues or the errors were never of strategy or tactics, but they were personal judgment? Uh, issues of strategy. If you get 70% right, you've done incredibly well. Right. You really have. And your biggest mistake is not making the decisions. So the biggest mistake is people. I mean, no one's going to get all, all issues of strategy right. Your biggest mistake in every organisation I've been, have been about people. How I've worked with people, how I've worked with boards or whatever, it's always those issues. Because, I mean, if you have a, an excellent support of I mean, the chair I had on the Olympics is a fantastic person. He was an eminent engineer, a guy called, um, he's now Sir John Armour. He'd ran the railways, he was you know, one of the most respected engineers in the country. And the great thing about John was, I could sit with him and say, listen, you know, this is really scary, I'm not sure how we're going, but this is what I intend to do. If you've got any other advice, tell me. Um, but I'm, I wasn't concerned about opening up to the guy and saying, we're going to have to take this risk here, and this is the decision. I'm, and he would say, well, if I were you, I wouldn't do that, or you're right off your tree there. And it was an excellent relationship where, um, where we could um, push off. He, he was clear he was a non-exec chair. He understood that role very clearly, but um, that relationship really, really worked. Previous chair, of course, absolute disaster. In the end, uh, I went to the government and said, take a choice, it's him or me. You know, if this isn't working, he's out of control. And, uh, and fortunately, they chose me. <laughs> Thank you. That was, in, that was in the first year of, of the Olympics, which is a, it was a scary time for the whole project. Uh, Sir David, my name's Dale Budd. I'm here on my own account. Most of my work is in the rail area. I'm on the reference group for the current uh, Australian government's current high-speed rail study. and. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more about the need to challenge the, uh, the cost figures as they appear to be. But my question is not about that. It's about um, PPPs, as we call them in Australia, perhaps PFIs for you. I have a concern that um, in some cases the, uh, these projects tend to be driven by financial engineering rather than what ought to be real engineering, whether it's railway engineering or road traffic engineering or whatever. And I'm an engineer engineer myself originally, and I think we have seen uh, projects here in Sydney where uh, the financial engineering has led to a suboptimal outcome. I'm not talking about the fact that, as one of our colleagues says, they tend to go bust and uh, someone buys them uh, cheaply later on. That, to me, doesn't matter, provided you've got a good piece of infrastructure. But I am concerned if the financial engineers, as they call them, lead to the project being manipulated in its design and you end up with an outcome which is not what it should be in the sense of a good road project or a good railway project. I wonder if you could comment on that, whether you've seen any examples of that or whether you disagree with me. Well, P PFIs are invented in the UK and they were invented by a good friend of mine called Adrian Montague and he developed within the Treasury Task Force. Um, in about um, uh, about 95, and um, I started work. I mean, he was he, he and I were the two people on the Dutch Treasury Committee advising in 2000. And PFIs were set up um, firstly because departments never set aside any money for maintenance, and so you'd have school buildings or hospitals or whatever. 
and they'd do the capital works, and then the first thing a department would cut would be its maintenance budget. And therefore, you had buildings or railway roofs or whatever that had just never been maintained. And the beauty about a PFI is it locked a box in place, and it said, and Treasury was saying, if you want to build that building, you better set aside the money to maintain it. And so the beauty about a PFI, it set the long-term asset plan in place. The second thing is it provided an external locked box for client change in their mind. Now, we have the famous uh, Scottish House of Parliament, um, which uh, went up 10 times because the clients were all the politicians. Uh, tragically, the Arctic died halfway through it, of course. But, um, but it's a classic, I've been through it recently, and it's a classic building and one where people just kept changing the design the whole way through. Now, with the PFI, once you've signed off on the scope, and the banking consortium gets together and gives the money, you can't change the box. So that's, I think, what it was set out originally to correct, which was wide-ranging cha change of scope and not planning for long-term whole life costing and setting aside money was a very good thing to do, and it bought that discipline. But you can achieve that by other ways, rather than PFIs. And I think now people have realised that the original PFIs are an expensive way of doing it. I think it would be blunt to say in the UK now, they look back and think they were a blunt instrument to solve a problem. And they were an expensive method because there's a different risk capital of when you're in the development stage and the maturity stage. And there are huge windfall profits made as you move from one to the other, which is a financing profit and nothing to do really with risk. And I think now the new PFIs um, are starting to recognise that. And they're much more, um, where they're moving to these... Um, what are called DIO structures now. They're starting to move for joint partnership companies where they're outsourced to a company which is jointly controlled on some government services. I mean, PFIs are still around. PPPs are still around. Long-term costing and maintenance um, planning is very, very important. But um, you've got to be able to make sure that the, the, the partner takes risk. And in early models, there is very little risk taken on demand or market demand. But the roads contracts in the UK, very good example of PFI, I think, that works. Long-term maintenance of roads. So I think they're maturing as a model. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just the early models were fairly blunt. Some people lost a huge amount of money on PFIs. Um, um, some of the famous hospital projects um, in Norwich and others uh, were very extractive. Right. How are we going? Yeah. Hi. Um, Leila Mehpour at Blend Lease. Um, Sydney has aspirations of being a global city that can compete with cities like New York and London and Tokyo. But density is a bit of a dirty word in housing in Sydney. Um, given that density is what makes infrastructure work, especially heavy rail, how can we change the attitudes of people towards what's a fundamental in the big cities around the world? I mean, density is a dirty word in most... I mean, you talk about density in the Cotswolds or, or in, in West London. I mean, they don't want to talk about it. I mean, they've got... I can't remember the anagram. It's, I don't care what it is, we're opposed to anything groups there, which that doesn't matter. They just don't want anything to happen. Um, Kensington's a classic case for that. So, um, so yeah, uh, density does, I mean, Hong Kong being the, Hong Kong and Singapore just being the, the, the poster child of how this should work properly. What fantastic models of how to use infrastructure, how to finance infrastructure, and how to use density effectively. But um, the thing about Sydney is it's geographically constrained, and I don't think people realise how much it is. You've got, you've got Royal National Park and Karinga and then the Western and the Blue Mountains, that you either destroy those parks when you get another million people in here or you really do something about density. And uh, it's the same issue for London. They say, let's build on the green, green belt. Well, a green belt's a massive value. It's lasted for 60 years and don't destroy it, except density where um, how, um, public transport can justify it. So we're building, they're building at the moment a 50-story tower in the middle of East London on the Olympic site. <coughs> that nine railway lines, it can justify that level with the public facilities and schools uh, eminently quickly. The other thing I, I would say in terms of, of, of housing growth, high speed two is justified on cutting the journey time from Birmingham to London by 20 minutes. And so what they do is they say we're saving um, 20 minutes GDP on everyone that travels on the train every year. And they calculate that and they say that's additional GDP for the country. I say that's fabulous. Except if you're like me, you get off the train and go to Cafe Nero and, and destroy the country's GDP. <laughs> and I say, well, if you want to justify on that basis, hey, that's great. If, you, if that works for you, good. Uh, the way I look at it is, if I have a high-speed service, it's every 10 minutes, there's a train going from Birmingham into Houston, and it takes 40 minutes, that's like Reading. And therefore, suddenly, Birmingham with 2 million people that has schools and facilities for 3 million people is a suburb of London. And if I've solved building in Kensington because I've just annexed Birmingham.
and what could you do in Sydney with a high speed service? What could you do in Brisbane with a high speed service to sell? Uh, thank you, sir. That, uh, George, perhaps you've got some name of the public interest in urban planning. Actually, my question is actually followed directly on from what you were alluding to. Um, the need probably for city that's going to save its green belt, its market gardens, etc., which is very valuable agricultural land, to go into the idea of satellite cities and maybe to use the concept of regenerating some of our uh, ailing uh, uh, sort of country towns that are, that are dying for various reasons and uh, need uh, manpower for agricultural workers and mining and what have you. Um, so the idea of fast trains then feeding into the city would, would, would okay. make some sense. So basically I just wanted you to comment firstly on where you see if, if there is value as you see it in the, the immense cost of building these things and maybe the need for interconnection, um, whether there is um, you know, some hidden costs maybe that you've uh, come across. Uh, and secondly, uh, again following on from uh, that first question, what do you see as the greatest bang for your buck that you get in an urban structure in terms of building a museum, a concert hall, a sporting stadium, or maybe an integrated complex as you've done in London as being maybe being the best way of generating value for what you put in there. Um, in, a, in the country towns, for example, there's probably an inbuilt uh, benefit because the property price is so low because everybody's leaving there. So there's a reason for people to go out there to, you know, in the Sydney real estate market, we know as it is, it makes a lot of sense then maybe that you get the value for the investment on your high speed train by the fact that people can actually afford uh, uh, property out there. Uh, whereas in the city, of course, uh, property prices are, are going to stay very high. So you need some real return. So I'm just wondering, have you had experience in what particular areas of, uh, you know, sort of human endeavour, shall we say, get the, the most return and where do you see uh, sort of uh, us heading maybe in Sydney in that regard? Well, I think, I think the issue of Sydney is, is, just, is population growth and this huge disparity between people having uh, accessibility to housing, young people, people coming into the, in the city, and it's very difficult to convince people to have greater density in the areas. And the only way I've... Um, cope with this uh, on some other situation. I was having a discussion, I call it, with my previous Secretary of State in transport. I've had three in 18 months. And she said, um, I can't cope with the idea necessarily that we're going to lose ticket offices because you know, it, it's politically very, very difficult. You've got disabled people, you've got people at night, people getting mugged. And I said, let's not talk about next year's closure you want to talk about. Let's go forward for 30 years' time. She said, why? When do you want to talk about 30 years' time? So let's just indulge me. So I said, in 30 years' time, there won't be tickets, will there? I said, no, I suppose not. I said, well, 80% of people buy tickets over the internet, even today. So in 30 years' time, they won't have tickets. You won't, you'll have whatever devices around that will tell you where your train is real time. It'll charge it. It'll give you the most effective fare. It will tell you the latest information on disruptions. And you'll get in the train. There won't be tickets at all. Do you agree with that? She said, yep. Yeah. I said, well, that's coming in 10 years' time, not 30 years' time. What are we going to do with it now? How do we deal with it? So how I would address your issue... I think if you get into this emotional debate today, it's really difficult. But I think if you said, let's look at the next 30 to 50 years in Sydney's growth and plan for that and work out what do we really want? What makes, so how do you cope with this growth? So is it high speed? What are the corridors to high speed? I mean, the fact that you can go from Ebb's Fleet on the edge of London now into central London in 15 minutes, it's changed all the house prices down Kent because Ashford is now, instead of an hour and a half, Ashford's 30 minutes away, so it's, it's a commuter belt. London. So it's changed Margate in that whole area. What could you do? The hardest thing you can ever build into a city is a park. And I used to have this argument all the time in East London because the temptation trying to recover the investment to build on the park, I used to say, what's wrong with you in giving the public a park? What problem do you have with it? And the great thing, um, which is a great thing about London is why it's a very livable city, it has an incredible number of parks. It's one of the greenest cities in Europe. And you, you think of Hyde Park or Green Park, but you've got Hampstead Heath and Clapham Common and Blackheath these are, and Richmond Park. These are massive, sprawling urban commons that were created a long, long time ago. And I think that if you look at the growth of Sydney, where are those equivalents? They're going to be in Sydney longer term. And in terms of value, that's what creates real quality and value for our communities, to plan those first and set that side of land because it's so tempting for governments and developers and everyone else. Only reason that London has its parks now is the historical parks is because there are royal hunting grounds. And governments and entrepreneurs and landowners couldn't sell them because they were the king's grounds. That's why we have Richmond Park and Hyde Park. So, 
So, David, uh, thanks for a great talk. I hope it's being recorded. My name is Robert Busby, and I do some uh, uh, work in uh, the Chem Engineering Department with final year students. I think there'll be a few others of us here. Can I ask for two messages? One for us who are involved in the development of our graduates, and another one for the graduates themselves. Well, I spend quite a bit of time dealing with graduates, um, both at the last job and at this job. And um, I, I, in fact, only, uh, the other week I was in Glasgow and I was looking at the mechanical engineers um, who were the top of the top of the country. I, I talked to three of them, and I was saying, um, "Where do you want to be?" And these people had lived in Glasgow and they'd been offered a job in Derby and they hadn't taken the job in Derby. I said, why didn't you take the job in Derby? And they said, well, who wants to go to Derby? I said, well, you can start in Glasgow, why not? And um, <laughs> I've been to Glasgow, I understand what it's like. And I said, when will you take a risk? When will you take a risk in your career? You don't want to leave Glasgow because you've got a nice house and you've got friends here and you're 24 years of age and you don't want to put yourself out. What does it have to be before you end up taking a risk in your career? Where do you want to be in 10 years' time? I said, well, I've never really thought about that. I said, well, think about it as a graduate. Think about where you want to be, know where you want to be, because at some point you're going to take a leap and you're going to take a risk, but you have to know where you want to go first. And if you don't work that out, you'll never take that risk. So my message to graduates is opportunities come at the least time when you expect them, but you have to think in your head what you want to do, and you have to make up your mind what you want to get to. Hey, you may just want to have a good time fine. Uh, that's what it is. But I think in the end, it's, it's interesting just to challenge um, graduates and, and talk to them about what their, their personal ambitions are and when they're going to risk their career in doing something. Yeah. Uh, so David, I uh, really enjoyed your, uh, your commentary in, uh, in the talk. Uh, Dennis Malone is my name, uh, a graduate engineer of this university and uh, retired uh, from my main uh, role in life, but do some uh, part-time work with uh, Gilbert and Tabin law firm at the moment. Um, I think the thing that's come through what you said tonight for me absolutely clearly is this, is, this transport thing is all about connecting uh, jobs and particularly where there's changing industry bases and, um, and people and allow them to uh, live economically and, and uh, in high quality. And so when I stop and think about the sort of the high speed rail proposals that have been floated in this country for many years. They've nearly always been Sydney, Melbourne, by Canberra because there's big populations. But after what I've heard tonight, it's, it should be much more you know, Sydney, Gosford, Newcastle, Hunter Valley to connect the people to jobs and vice versa because the mining industry is going to be changing over, over quite some years. And uh, similarly to the, uh, the South West. And similarly, Melbourne should look after its own with you know, Ballarat and Bendigo and Geelong and so on. And if those links were established for good economic long-term reasons, ultimately one day you may say, well, why don't we connect you know, Bendigo with um, um, Wagga or wherever the, the high speed, or uh, Canberra, say, where it might terminate. So I don't think the thinking has been as clear here as you've made it tonight. So I thank you very much for that. And I was just, second part of a question would be, have you got any comment about the the role of unions in the UK and what your new role is, uh, is taking on board, because I think the government here is, they don't seem to be able to solve the union problem, and I, I, I despair a bit at that. Well, to your point on high speed, I would, I would um, protect the high speed lines between Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane now. I would do all the work and protect it. But you don't have to build them today, but the thing that paid for the high speed line in Kent it's not the line to Paris, because that doesn't pay for it, the, the act track access. What pays for it is a high-speed domestic service every day, trains going every 10 minutes from Kent. And so if you, if you define the high-speed line from Sydney to Melbourne and then dedicate the first steps to the high-speed service from Campbelltown in and similarly in Melbourne and protected those lines or built them even, and then eventually you want to connect the rest of the cities, then fine. I tell you, you'd pay for it by... I mean, if you could have... Uh, Canberra within 15 minutes. I mean, the classic one I always like is the Gold Coast and, and Brisbane. I mean, the Gold Coast is a deprived area. I mean, I know we think it's flash, but it's deprived because it depends on tourism and manufacturing, both of which have been heavily hit with the, with the dollar, the high dollar. Brisbane's booming. Uh, it has a population challenge. It doesn't know where to expand. You've got a million people living in the Gold Coast. You've tried that rail motor going up to Brisbane. I've tried it a number of times. Um, it should be a train going every 10 minutes, 12-car train there. It's not difficult to do, and it should be a maximum of a half hour to go there. We've got an eight-lane motorway, which you've got to leave 
Brisbane now at four o'clock to avoid being jammed on it. It's only been open a few years. So, so that's where, where um, you, provided you have a plan. As for the unions, um, yeah, we have the, our equivalent of the CMFEU, which is the RMT uh, in the UK, a guy called Bob Crow. Only advantage is he has an Aussie wife, uh, which is always a plus, um, and his um, brother's a hedge fund trader, so uh, he's quite commercial. Um, and I've always found um, uh, he's very, he's quite clear. I mean, I've said to Bob, I, I'm, I said, listen, I'm never going to be necessarily like you. I'm never going to be on the same side of politics as you, but we can have an open relationship. I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing. In fact, I want your key person, this guy called Mick Cash, who's a key union organiser in the whole of the UK, to sit on our board on a key safety committee where our board grills all of us executives. And I want no holes barred. I want them to see everything we do in our company. And the executive of the RMT said, uh, we can't do this, we can't have, we can't have our guy inside the board be compromised. Took him about four months to finally vote on it. And then he turns up, and after about three me meetings, he's getting into this along with the rest of the non-execs. So he's enjoying it all. But it's taken away, uh, and he now starts to understand what difficulties we deal with. And he's, he's an excellent director, I have to say. But uh, I think a lot of it is, uh, hey, it, you have to, I mean, the problem here is you're in a booming market and there's a shortage of supply, and so why wouldn't they do what they do? And, and uh, our only um, threat in the UK is with our settlement, the fact that we are in a recession-driven economy, people understand that jobs are really hard to get by. And so it's really, really difficult, I think, for them to call out or hold long strikes. I think people are very, very concerned about job security. It's a different story here. So I don't have any easy solutions to hear. Hello, it's Jordan Chong from Australian Associated Press. Um, I'm just curious about a couple of things, say with the proposed second airport in Sydney or the proposed third runway in London. Um, you talked about you need to get the community on side and clearly the community has been very vocal in both instances against such proposals. So is that a, is that a failure of you know, the government's ability to communicate the, the vision or, or does the argument just not stack up and therefore, you know, people just not, not buying it? I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, about that topic, please. When I came, was coming to Australia, I talked to my head of media, a guy called uh, Tom Kelly, who worked in Number 10 for years, and I said, I'm going on holidays and I'm coming to a number of conferences and speaking at things. I said, what rule should I take? He said, you should take the rule that anything you say in Australia will read the next morning in London. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to comment on the third runway because I can add nothing to the debate that um, David Cameron and Boris Johnson haven't already uh, been in, in discussion with uh, very publicly in the press. So I'll talk about Sydney Airport because it's not, it's not controversial in, in England. And all I'd say is if you do want to build another runway, um, in Sydney, which may well be sensible. I don't know the capacity constraints of King's Fifth. You're going to have to do a damn good job of explaining to the communities that surround the airports why it's something more than just shoving an airport in their area there. You're going to have to have a whole different package of why it's going to be a great benefit in terms of jobs, public parks, other benefits and accessibility through high-speed rail back into Sydney to jobs to sell that story. Because they're not just going to say, this is a great idea to shove a couple of runways in the middle of our community anymore. You might have got away with it 30 years ago, but not now. I'm not saying it's not, it's not that it's not achievable. It is achievable. But you're going to have to have a much bigger package to get that across with the, with the electorate. I didn't answer your question. I know. And I wasn't going to fall for it. <laughs> um, I think we've taken uh, quite uh, a lot of your time. Um, and as you fight jet lag, um, uh, we're seriously impressed with you managing to stay and answer all these questions. You certainly took us on a narrative, and a narrative that I think we all learned something uh, from. I saw the bridge in Sweden, between, between Sweden and Denmark, and I thought, ha, huh, well, we just need to build a bridge between Ireland and England and all will be fixed. Um, and then the Channel Tunnel, then that's an interesting story about France and England, because I get that about the poor food and the poor coffee. Maybe the Scots should have told them about the good haggis and good whiskey, and, <laughs> and perhaps that would have changed things. Um, now, that's all good. Uh, you've been very, very generous with your time, uh, your thoughts, and I think your uh, Sydney ideas. I think we've enjoyed them immensely, this series of talks uh, that's given by the university and alumni and others. 
uh, is a, exactly about that, feeding ideas into the community, the community of the university. I think you've done an excellent job of that and stimulated lots of ideas, lots of discussion, and taken us way outside technical uh, engineering. So I thank you for that, and uh, I'm going to make my own uh, Olympic-style baton change, if you like. Uh, and uh, with that, I would like to ask audience to thank you for your fantastic. Thank you.